Yeah, hi folks. Yes, our recently resigned dear leader, Jacinda Ardern, was fawned over by the global left-wing media. But she was detested in New Zealand by everyone with half a brain. And our, and our left-wing media in New Zealand even had the audacity to call her a victim of hate. And not one of them questioned why. Well, here's some reasons why. But first... Now, this is where Adern began losing people. She fawned over Muslims in Christchurch after thousands of people around the world were slaughtered at the hands of radical Islamic terrorists. And then the gun grab and the attack on free speech began. become a more peaceful and united country from the introduction of a law that allows people to be fined or jailed for, quote, insulting a religion. Oh. Mr. Speaker, as we have debated and discussed in this House uh, many times before, uh, we already have provision in our Human Rights Act uh, to prevent incitement, Mr. Speaker, based uh, on uh, ethnicity or race. Uh, what we have simply uh, done, Mr Speaker, is add the word religion. If the member has a fundamental issue with the human rights legislation as it stands, that's a matter for the member. Obviously on this side of the House we support the existing legislation but believe it should be extended. So is the Prime Minister's position that this addition of religion to the Human Rights Act will make no difference or that it will actually allow people to be prosecuted for insulting religions? No, Mr Speaker, it, my argument is not that it will make no difference. So my argument do? is that we already have an existing framework in which the legal parameters can already be tested around issues like, for instance, race. Uh, and we have added now uh, the additional uh, uh, word of religion. That is based, of course, on the experience that we've had in New Zealand, the sad experience we've had in New Zealand. Ah, to protect Muslims, not Christians. It will also be important in understanding more about mis- and disinformation online, a challenge that we must, as leaders, address. Sadly, I think it's easy to dismiss this problem as one in the margins. I can certainly understand the desire to leave it to someone else. As leaders, we're rightly concerned that even the most light-touch approaches to disinformation could be misinterpreted as being hostile to the values of free speech that we value so highly. Now, this is indeed an interesting topic, but there are some big problems with what Jacinda is proposing. She glosses over how any restrictions on speech and communication would impact our ability to discuss issues freely. And who exactly is deciding what is true and what is false? Politicians? Do you trust politicians to make that call? Do you trust anyone to make that call? The sort of authoritarian-minded people who tend to desire that level of control over speech are the very last people you would want making the decisions. And we know this because of the inflammatory language Ardern uses to sell her idea to the world. How do you ensure the human rights of others are upheld when they are subjected to hateful and dangerous rhetoric and ideology? The weapons may be different, but the goals of those who perpetuate them is often the same, to cause chaos and reduce the ability of others to defend themselves, to disband communities, 
to collapse the collective strength of countries who work together. But we have an opportunity here to ensure that these particular weapons of war do not become an established part of warfare. Speech is a weapon of war. Now, on the back of complaining about mis and disinformation, she comes out with these lies. Government notice of motion number one in my name regarding a declaration of a climate emergency. Mr Speaker, I think the first and most important point to make is that this is a declaration based on science. Right. The United Nations Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the preeminent scientific body in the world on this matter, has determined that in order to avoid a situation, a disastrous 1.5 degrees Celsius rise in global temperatures and beyond, a rise that would see increased risk to human health and livelihood, civil unrest, mass drought, mass disease, loss of lands and homes, increased fires, increased tropical storms, mass human displacement and globally exhausted resources, then we must act with urgency, Mr Speaker, to ensure global emissions fall to net zero by 2050. And this includes her attack on farmers. New Zealand farmers are furious they could soon be paying a tax for methane emissions produced by their livestock. From 2025, the government wants to introduce what's known as a fart tax. It'll affect more than 50,000 farms, that's 10 million cows and 26 million sheep. The sector is responsible for more than half of New Zealand's emissions, and the levy would contribute to the country's goal of being climate neutral by 2050. With what's being proposed, especially around the emission tax, it's just going to wipe out a huge percentage of the agricultural um, community. Uh, it's going to make uh, what I would call the mum and dad farmers, um, they're just not going to be able to afford to do it. And then to see all that um, good arable land converted into what I'd call carbon credits and just planting it in pine trees is just absolutely nuts. It's just a waste of um, good productivity, it's a waste of job creation, it's just, it's, yeah, it's just wasteful. We're protesting against the unworkable regulations, in particular this recent one of the um, carbon tax that they uh, sent out that has really, really going to damage farming. Yeah, and of course, this is all driven by Adern's Great Reset people. Food for all 8 billion people in this world. So it's a very important point that you are addressing. Um, my daughter, 24, inspired me and said, Dad, how can you advocate for these zero carbon value chains if you still eat meat? And so I stopped eating meat. Now the math would say, well, you need to stop eating meat 11 years to compensate for a flight to Thailand. Yes. But if a billion people stop eating meat, I tell you it has a big impact. Not only does it have a big impact on the current food system, but it will also inspire innovation of food systems. Mm -hmm. And I predict that we will have proteins not coming from um, meat in the future. They will probably taste even better. So why are we trying to mimic meat if we can have a better taste? Now he's talking about grasshoppers and crickets there, but won't mention that. They will be zero carbon and much healthier than the kind of food that we eat today. That is a mission that we need to get on. I can inspire you to maybe look at an organization called EAT, easy to remember, EAT, <laughs> who have all the facts on this.
Now, I think Three Waters was Adern's biggest downfall. Something's taken from you. You would expect to be compensated. It's all <laughs> It is theft, and so we've got, in Timaru, we've got $440 million worth of assets. The government's taking those away from us, and what are we get it, going to get in return? Absolute zilch. That we can stop Three Waters, or at least make this issue so damaging to the government that it becomes a serious vote-losing issue. And it has... Three Waters is perhaps this government's most contentious proposal, and the minister responsible admits she's made some mistakes. There are two areas of the Three Waters reform program which I underestimated, and I acknowledge that's my responsibility. The first one is that I underestimated that the public really knew what was happening with pipes under the ground, and they had a lot more knowledge about the trade-offs that councils were always making. Yes, the arrogant woman thought we were all stupid. Dozens of councils opposed the reforms, which would bring drinking, storm and wastewater out of their control and into the management of four regional entities. Imagine Aotearoa without good water. The government's efforts to win over the public with an advertising campaign ended up backfiring. And I acknowledge that decades of un underinvestment in water infrastructure is within the council mm. purview, but perhaps the, the advertising campaign wasn't the best way to tell the message. So again, those are two areas that I underestimated that I got wrong and I accept responsibility for that. But on Q&A, Nanaia Mahuta stood by the proposed co-governance model, which would see Māori make up half the representatives on the new entity's boards. Are you the best person to continue pushing Three Waters forward? I, I, I think I am. And of course, Mahuta is as corrupt as they come. I want to talk about your family. Yeah. Act leader David Seymour and National MP Simeon Brown have questioned members of your family receiving government contracts in the time that you have been a government minister. Have you ever had an undeclared or mishandled conflict of interest as a cabinet minister? I've had a, a, a situation over these number of years to really consider my family obligations. So I have declared conflicts. They've been managed appropriately and in accordance with the Cabinet Manual, uh, certainly since I've been a minister. And the challenge for me, I guess, is just how um, toxic the attacks have been. And of course, Adern's separatist Maori Health Authority is now being used to push for more separatism. A report on Māori co-governance... No, this is not co-governance, this is separatism. ...has revealed calls for the Māori Health Authority model to be applied to other sectors like education and justice. It follows consultation with Māori on how New Zealand can meet its United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. Here's political reporter Imogen Wells. I was going to say something horrible about Mr Seymour, but I won't do that. The first thing our Māori Development Minister wants you to know about today's document dump is... This is not about He Pua Pua. He Pua Pua is a controversial think piece on Māori co-governance. David Seymour says this report is that. So people can argue about whether or not this is the same or different, it's part of the same kaupapa. What the government's actually released today is a report on six months' worth of consultation with Māori on how best to honour our obligations under the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, something the National Party signed us up for back in 2010. In the report, there are requests for an independent Māori education authority and something similar for our justice system too. And many shared a desire for governance over their whenua. So we should have a look at all the social services sector organisations. And... Ah, Matthew Tukaki, the biggest scammer ever. Say, well, look, is this our opportunity to really change the dial for Māori deprivation? And we all suffered under Adern's draconian COVID lockdowns, etc. I mean, the reality is that her policies on COVID were an absolute disaster. Um, she finally saw sense, but not before a huge amount of damage had been done. You know, she pursued this utterly insane zero COVID policy 
uh, subjecting her own people to the most extraordinary repression, uh, all the while with this weird smile on her face, mm. deeply sinister, uh, and, you know, locking her own citizens out of their own country. If they happen to be in the wrong place when her policies came into force, some of them were not able to get back into their own country. Quite an extraordinary thing to do. And awful tales of people not being able to give birth with the people they loved around. I mean, just horrible, horrible stuff. Um, I'm just hoping that maybe Justin Trudeau might might be next. Yeah. Now have a listen to how she wanted to treat the unvaccinated. She actually boasted, this is a so-called socialist, yeah, right, uh, she boasted of two classes of people within New Zealand. She was happy to see two classes of people. Talk about demonising one group of people at the expense of others. Have a listen to this and look at the smug expression on this woman's face when she declares as Prime Minister of New Zealand that there are now two classes of people in New Zealand, the dirty and the filthy and the pure. So you basically said this is going to be like, well, it's almost like uh, you probably don't see it like this, the two different classes of people. If you're vaccinated or if you're unvaccinated, you have all these rights. If you are vaccinated... That is what it is. So, yep. Yeah. Yep. Oh. Yep. Yep. That is what it is, folks. That's what you had in New Zealand. Two classes of people. That's your socialist governments for you. And also your socialist governments, guess what else they do? They believe, as George Orwell told us, that they are the font of all knowledge. They are the source of all truth. There is no truth other than Big Jacinta or Big Brother or Big Sister or whatever you want to call it. <laughs> <laughs> but have a listen to this disgraceful uh, proponent uh, uh, selling of her idea that only the government has the truth and only her government has the truth. You can also trust the Director General of Health and the Ministry of Health. For that information, do feel free to visit at any time to clarify any rumour you may hear, covid19.govt.nz. Otherwise, dismiss anything else. We will continue to be your single source of truth. This, is, the, source of this truth. is modern socialism. We are the sole source of truth. And then when you get an independent journalist tries to question her, oh, you just shut them down. You're only allowed to have the accredited journalist. Yeah. And after all that misery Adern put us through, our delusional media somehow thinks we should love her. No, the buck stops with her. She was the Prime Minister, and getting derogatory feedback goes with the territory.